Hi folks, welcome to unit three. This is the last unit in our course and we're gonna start talking about where modern humans came from. Why do we look the way we are? Why are we the way we are? We've been sort of tackling this question piece by piece with each unit. Um, this unit is gonna focus on our ancestors. In other words, the fossil hominins that came before us. The first question I'm sure a lot of you have is what the hell's a hominin? A lot of people have never heard this term before. If you have, you may not fully grasp what it means. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to really talk about what the term hominin means and why we use it in referring to our paleo ancestors. We are a hominin, as are all of our ancestors. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that is significant. Okay. First things first, you're going to see a lot of charts like this. This is kind of our ancestral family tree. There we are at the very top where it says modern humans. And you can see there's a lot of fossil skulls going all the way back to about 7 million years ago. We're going to talk about some of these individuals. Relax, we're not going to hit every single one of them. In fact, we're only going to jump around to the ones that uh, we have a lot of information on and I can kind of give you a better idea on how they played a major role in getting us to where we are today. So we're going to look into these different groups and even some of these different individuals, which is what they are. If you look at these skulls, a lot of them uh, are representational of a single individual, and those single individuals you'll become fairly acquainted with as you continue your career as a physical anthropologist. First of all, what is a hominin and how do we define that? Well, if you remember the Linnaean taxonom taxonomic chart, getting down midway, we start to see the hominoids. Hominoids, as you can see here, includes all of the apes. That is gibbons and siamangs, which are lesser apes, and then the great ape families like orangutan, gorilla, chimp, bonobo and human. But the first one that we knock out at the hominid level, by the way, hominoid is what we would call the hominoidae group, which is up here at the very top in this kind of hot pink. We sort of drop the EA at the end when we're talking colloquially. So we say the hominoids, the hominids, and then the hominini which we really shorten to hominin. This was, is also the hominins, which includes really all the apes, but we're really talking at this level. And in fact, to simplify as we go on, we're really going to be concerned with the hominins that follow along this line right here. After our separation with Pan, which are the bonobos and the chimpanzees, this is our family tree. All of the individuals that you saw on the previous slide start here and go this way to here. So hominins really include, um, since Olato anyway, includes Pan. But the way we're going to be doing it in a pseudo senso stricto, sorry, there's, that's a bunch of Latin, in the strictest sense, we're going to be talking about the hominins after that split with the pan. So we're going to start with the proto groups like Sahelanthropus chadensis, and then we're going to carry it all the way up through to our closest relative, who is Neanderthal. That's the last one that we're going to end up on. Okay. So now we know sort of what we're talking about, and how it fits in the grand scheme of things. Let me put it this way. Gibbons and Siamangs, which are the lesser apes, are the first ones that we kick out of our family tree. They're the least related to us. The next least related to us are the orangutans. Next, the gorillas. And finally, chimpanzees and bonobos are our closest living relatives. But the ones that we're going to talk about would have been even closer than Pan but they're no longer living. So what defines hominins senso stricto is we're going to talk about them. Well, what defines a hominin away from all the other apes 
is that we are bipedal. We walk on two feet. Now, technically, those other animals, the chimps, the siamangs, the bonobos, the gorillas, and even the uh, orangutans can all walk on two feet. So we actually narrow it down to what we call a habitual or even an obligate biped. We, you and I, are obligate bipeds. That is, we virtually spend all our time walking on two feet. Now, you can make the argument, what about when we're babies and we're crawling? Or any adult can crawl if we want to. The answer I always come up with, and for that matter, chimps can walk on two feet. So how do you differentiate that? How do you know that something is a quadruped, like a chimp, which walks on four feet, versus a biped, like you and I, which walk on two feet? The easiest answer, chase them. If you're getting chased by a bear, you and your buddy the chimp are being chased by a bear down the street or through the woods, what are you going to do? You're going to get up and run. You're certainly not going to drop down on all fours and start crawling. The chimp, on the other hand, certainly isn't going to try to walk away on two feet. They're going to drop down onto all fours and take off running. And guess what? Chimp's going to beat you. You're going to lose that foot race. The bear is going to get you. I hate to tell you. Besides that, the chimp's probably going to shoot up a tree since it comes across. You're screwed. Don't get into a foot race with a chimp. <laughs> or a climbing race. Eh, just don't get into a race with a chimp. Unless it's going to be long distance. That's the only one we can we can beat them at. Okay, so fundamentally, I want you to picture hominins, at least in this lecture, the way we're going to talk about them, as a bipedal ape, which is what you and I are. Remember, we're apes and we're bipeds. We're the only bipedal ape out there, uh, but we're not the only ones that ever existed. All the ones, starting with Sahelanthropus chatensis, seven million years ago, have walked on two feet. And that's what defines our family tree, our direct family, our close family. We're all bipeds. In fact, if you remember all the way back to the first lecture in this series, I told you Day one, the thing that defines humans, anatomically modern humans, you and I, are our feet. Our feet are so unique amongst the ape world, and virtually uh, not much else in our bodies are. Okay, so I'm certain everybody in here who's looking at this has seen this image before. This is the famous or infamous Ascent of Man, as it was named because we were sexist and didn't have a lot of information at the time. Granted, the artist that did this, uh, this was in a Time Life book in the 1950s, did the best they could with what they had. However, there are a lot of problems with this image. First and foremost is if we look at the image, you look back here, this is a gibbon. This is a chimp. If, if this is a timeline, if we're looking at it as early to modern, right, like ancient to modern, are gibbons and chimps, are they ancient? Are they ancient life forms? No. The, the chimp and the gibbon have the usher come back and say, excuse me, sirs, come with me, and step right up here in line, side by side with anatomically modern humans. We're all here today. So that means that they're just as evolved as us for doing what they do. We do different things. We live in cities. We do things. But they're just as evolved. If you want to challenge that, think about it this way. What do you need to go camping? Just go camping for the weekend. Think about all the crap you have to bring. You bring something to cook with. You bring something to live in, a little tent. You bring clothing. You bring food, you bring tools, you bring all kinds, you bring so much shit to go camping, you end up loading it into the back of the car. In fact, you have to take a car to go camping. At best, you might be able to stuff it all into a backpack. How many chimps do you see wearing backpacks? How many chimps have to carry all that stuff with them in order to go camping? Which is, by the way, what they call living every day. We are not prepared. Our bodies are so adapted 
to living the way we live that we cannot live in the wild without all of our stuff. We're the only animal that has to drag a ton of crap with us to survive. Think about that for a minute. And think about what would happen if we didn't have access to anything. So, truth is, this is not a correct image for a lot of reasons. One, there's living animals on it. They're representing our past. But the biggest thing, the biggest problem with this image is that it's linear. It makes it seem like two of these guys got together and made one of these, and then these, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. So this guy can trace his family tree directly back to this one. Well, in a way that's true, and in a way it's not. It gets pretty confusing. Bottom line is, you've got to think, you've got to kind of stretch each one of these individuals out to hundreds of individuals. And these hundreds of individuals, out of them, a couple of them get together and one of these things show up. A bunch of other hundreds of these things show up. And then one of these things has a little advantage that moves up and becomes this thing and this thing and this thing. So it's not as linear as it seems. It kind of bounces all over the place. The best analogy I've ever heard for that was, this is from Lee Berger, you can imagine rivulets running down a mountain. So the water all starts up at the top of the mountain in the form of melting ice, right? The melting glacier at the top of the mountain. And it all ends up down at the bottom of the mountain in a lake. But the little tiny rivulets, the little rivers that are coming down the side of the mountain, it's going to split into hundreds of them at some points and then merge to a couple and then split up again and fall apart. And Is all of the water going to make it down taking the same path to the river at the bottom. No, they're going to take all kinds of different paths. That's the best way you can imagine human evolution. We started at the same nucleus, at the same starting point, up there in the glacier at the top of the mountain. And then all sorts of families do all sorts of things. Some of them merge, some of them separate apart, some of them die off, and some of them their offspring make it all the way down to the bottom, into the lake. So you can imagine that as die-offs, evolutionary extinctions, things like that going down the mountain. That's the best way I can think of to visualize how evolution actually works. If there are a lot of ideas that human fossils, because there are so few of them, they can't possibly represent humanity. Well, and it's even gone so far as to some people, like Ken Ham, the guy who came up with the Creation Museum, to say it's all not true, that those fossils are not actually humans or related to humans in any way, because there's too few of them and it doesn't prove anything. And yet, if it comes to anything that is non-human, they will say, oh yeah, sure, there's fossils of that, like dinosaurs. You can imagine asking Ken Ham, hey, did Tyrannosaurus rex exist? He's going to say, yep. But there are only a total of 50 known T. rex fossils, and less than 20% of those are complete. There are a total of 183 known hominin fossils that are nearly complete, which means there is over three times the evidence of hominin existence than there is dinosaur existence. Interesting. Food for thought. This is a slightly better image, and this is the one I'll probably use throughout most of this course. This is hominin evolution. Unfortunately, it's written hominid because that's the old term for it. It's a long story, but anyway. Uh, hominid, hominin, we're going to stick with hominin for this course. But this is our hominin evolution. And what we're looking at here is starting over here with Sahelanthropus chadensis, right around 7 million years ago. This individual started to split off from our last common ancestor, that's what LCA means. We don't know when exactly they split. In fact, 
it's more than likely that they were able to interbreed with these guys for a while anyway until they weren't. Remember, it takes about a million years for our species to speciate. But Sahelanthropus chadensis, whom we'll go into much more detail later in the next uh, conversation that I have with you guys, is the starting point, as far as we know, of our family tree. He's all of our grandpa. I say he because the individual that we found is male. Uh, there are some others that we don't, we can't assess uh, sex to. But you'll hear me say that. For example, uh, Australopithecus afarensis, the most famous of whom is Lucy, whom you guys have all heard about. You'll hear me call the entire species she or her. I'll do the same thing with Floresiensis. Um, the reason is I. I tend to associate them with their in the fossil individuals who are the type specimen for that species. And as such, I humanize them by calling them by their gender or their sex. And honestly, it's not a great practice to get into, but I just sort of do it automatically. So as I go through, this is sort of my, my precursory uh, explanation for the fact that I'm going to do that throughout I'll call but please know that any species that is successful in any way obviously has males and females of course otherwise they wouldn't survive um, there are a couple species uh, and genus in here which I wholeheartedly disagree with and going back to something I mentioned earlier, I assure you we don't have to learn every single one of these. We're going to learn the superstars. I call them my superstars of evolution. They're the ones who really represent a great leap in something dramatic happening and those that we know a lot about. Now, there are some who are really, really interesting and really special, but we don't know a whole lot about them. So we'll skip over those, but know they exist. We'll talk about, like, for example, Australopithecus sediba, who's this guy right here, kind of in the middle. Um, and then there's a couple others that we'll talk a little less about, like Homo naledi, who didn't even make this chart. They're so new. We'll talk a smidge about them, but not a whole lot. Okay, my lovelies, that's pretty much the end of this uh, talk, but I had a request earlier to kind of give you a take-home message, which I do often with my face-to-face -face classes, and I apologize that I forgot to do that up until now. The take-home messages that we have for this particular talk are the following. One, we're a hominin. Hominins are based on the fact that we're bipeds. In fact, everybody who's on this chart in front of your face right now is a biped. They walk on two feet. The second take-home message is that evolution is not a linear thing. It takes all kinds of twists and turns. Groups that seem like they're going to be the most successful species on the planet die out from one thing or another. Other groups that don't seem like they should be able to make it actually make it. Yours truly included. We are uh, a species that lucked out at least three times. And that's the only reason we're still here. It's pretty tenuous. The last thing, the big take-home message, and this one I want you to take to heart probably more than anything, is don't be daunted by these big names. There's only a few of these guys that we're going to meet. Yes, they do have new names to most of you. Most of you know a lot of their first names, like, for example, Homo. Genus Homo, if you notice, all the ones that are lit up in blue, are H, Homo habilis, Homo floresiensis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis. We also have Australopithecines, Paranthropus, and Sahelanthropus. Those are literally all the first names you're going to have to learn, except for Kenyanthropus, which is crap anyway, and we'll talk about that one later on. I'll beat up on that one. There's a few of these things that we're going to beat up on. And the reason being, it kind of shows us how to do good science. So with that, I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. Take home message. Don't freak out about how many things there are here or how many names. You're going to do fine. All right. Talk to you guys soon.